And greetings to you. Joe Rubenstein here, producer and host of Real Time 1960s. I want to thank you very much for joining me today for this portal into the past where I document the 60s in real time with podcasts like this, with our evening news reports, with audio clips and commercials of the day, as well as our daily timeline. And that timeline, along with each and every podcast, links to social media, how to reach us directly, it's all there for you on our website, realtime1960s.com. And if you love what we're doing and you want even more content, visit patreon.com slash realtime1960s, support this project, and in return, get exclusive access to members-only posts and two additional monthly podcast series, special report, and films of the 60s. For more information on the benefits of supporting us through Patreon, visit patreon.com slash realtime1960s or drop me an email, realtime1960s at gmail.com. And today, we take the next step up, my ranked list of the top 10 films of 1963. Last time, we covered my 10th ranked film from Russia with Love, and today, we move on to number 9. So without further ado, the best of 63 at the movies part 2, right now. And today's film has two things in common with From Russia With Love and two things only. It is based on a novel and it is a British production. And that's it because while the James Bond film is a frankly commercial enterprise using conventional cinematic techniques to achieve its aim, namely escapist entertainment, today's film, This Sporting Life, is a low-budget independent enterprise using avant-garde film techniques to achieve its aim, which is not to escape reality, but to explore it, or at least one slice of it. The film deals primarily with a man, a coal miner turned rugby league football player named Frank Machen, but it also depicts in semi-documentary style an environment, a gritty industrial city in the north of England, a city unnamed in the film, but the exteriors were shot in Wakefield, an environment so far removed from the cosmopolitan world of James Bond that the two films might as well take place on different planets. Another factor separating the two films is that the creative team behind the Bond film had decades of combined experience in feature filmmaking, while the creators of This Sporting Life, producer Carol Rice, director Lindsay Anderson, screenwriter David Story, and lead actor Richard Harris, were all novices in their respective roles. Rice had directed one feature film, but had never produced. Anderson had directed short documentaries, but no features of any kind, it was David Story's first screenplay, and Richard Harris, 32 when this film was shot, had played only supporting roles in feature films. He had a few lines in The Guns of Navarone, released in 61, and then a much larger but still supporting role in the disastrous uh, remake of Mutiny on the Bounty, uh, starring Marlon Brando, which, to call that a troubled production, is like saying uh, the ocean is a little damp. There's a story that kind of crystallizes the chaos of that shoot, most of which took place in Tahiti. At one point, uh, late in the production, a cameraman uh, yelled out to a crew member, wake up the director, he's in the shot. So, (laughs) anarchy in the South Pacific. But for Harris, a kind of saving grace arrived at this uh, Tahitian mayhem in the form of a script from director Lindsay Anderson, who'd been greatly impressed by one of Harris's stage performances in London, and that script was for this sporting life. And Harris's portrayal of Frank Machen was not only his first lead role, it was the role of a lifetime. And his electric performance earned both an Oscar nomination and the Cannes Film Festival's Best Actor Award, which led to collaborations with some of the top directors of the era, including Antonioni in 64, Peckinpah in 65, and John Huston in 66. But this is a film that's loaded with great performances, as are most of the British New Wave films. I'll get into the British New Wave later, but if nothing else, uh, these films introduced the world to a number of brilliant actors. So This Sporting Life was not just uh, David Story's first screenplay, it was based on his first novel, Story 27, when This Sporting Life was published in 1960, had been leading a kind of schizophrenic life. Son of a coal miner, he grew up in Wakefield, 
but he had had artistic inclinations since his teen years as both a writer and a painter. But at the same time, uh, he was a standout rugby player in prep school as well. And since his parents were in no position to fund his art school education in London or his early years as an artist, Story decided to try out for the Leeds Rugby League Football Club, which rugby league is the highest level of the sport in Europe, analogous to our NFL. There was also at that time rugby union football, one step down and played mostly by working coal miners. It paid a lot less. But Story, having made the team, played halfback on weekends and did his writing and art during the week. So as I said, a kind of split life. He later said his rugby teammates all thought he was gay because he was an artist, and the artists all thought he was a moron because he was a footballer. But it made sense financially. I mean, his signing bonus alone was more than his father made in two years in the coal mine. Of course, uh, Story never became a star player, but that was never the goal. As he later admitted, uh, he spent most of his time on the rugby field, or pitch, as they call it, trying to avoid a serious injury, which in that sport is no small task. And by the way, you don't need to know anything about rugby, which from an American perspective is sort of an amalgamation of our football plus soccer with a little polo thrown in, but you don't even need to know that to understand uh, this film, so don't let that dissuade you. The matches are presented not so much as narrative games, but as savage spectacles, with the camera pulled in tight on these uh, animalistic scrums in the mud. It's a brutal sport, arguably the most brutal team sports still being played today. I mean, obviously, American football is extremely violent, but at least those guys wear helmets. Rugby players do not, and they wear a fraction of the protective gear, which is insane. But Story, in this first novel, was, at least in part, trying to reconcile this world of physical brutality represented by Machen, the coal miner turned rugby player. And by the way, Story said he chose that name, Machen, because it's one letter short of machine. But to me, uh, this character, while intelligent and uh, not without some sensitivity, seems more animalistic than machine-like. In fact, at one point, uh, he refers to himself as a great ape on a football field. But contrasting with Machen is the more emotional, vulnerable world embodied by the female lead character, Mrs. Hammond, Machen's landlady, played by Welsh actress Rachel Roberts, who was also nominated for an Oscar. Uh, Mrs. Hammond is a widow with two young children. Her husband, we later learn, committed suicide at the factory where he worked. So she rents out one room of her house to Machen, and they commence an affair, although, oddly enough, Machen continues to refer to her as Mrs. Hammond, I guess to symbolize that despite the physical relationship, true intimacy is never really achieved. But the general dynamic in this relationship uh, is somewhat similar to the male-female relationship in Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull, another sports movie about much more than sports. Scorsese, who in 1963 was an NYU film student, saw this sporting life that year in the theater and was floored by it, and has since acknowledged it as an influence. But both films present a man who channels his rage into violent athletic performances that earn him money and fame, but who lacks the tools to navigate the more delicate world of relationships, and so falls back on the aggressiveness that has paid dividends in his work, but which, when applied to relationships, is totally destructive. Now, Machen is not remotely as abusive as boxer uh, Jake LaMotta, played by Robert De Niro in Raging Bull, who brutalizes both his wife and his brother. And from what I've heard about the real LaMotta, the violence was actually toned down from real life, which, if you've seen that film, is disturbing, uh, food for thought. But here, Machen's uh, only act of violence uh, toward Mrs. Hammond occurs toward the end of the film when he slaps her in response to an especially cruel insult and then immediately regrets it. Now, it should also be said, without justifying the slap, uh, that Mrs. Hammond frequently belittles Machen with various uh, taunts and insults. And when he finally tells her he loves her, uh, she spits in his face. So there's that. But Machen uh, is seeking more than just physical satisfaction with Mrs. Hammond. What he's trying to do is to rescue her from her self-confining emotional dungeon, in which uh, she grossly idealizes her dead husband uh, to the point of polishing his boots every night 
and just uh, shuts out the world. But Machen goes about this uh, somewhat naive rescue operation mostly wrong, just pushing and pushing like it's a rugby scrum. And when he does take a gentler approach and partially succeeds in eliciting some of her buried emotion and uh, desire, she doesn't like it. There's too much pain that comes with it. So I mentioned avant-garde techniques uh, used in this film, the most striking of which is the innovative use of flashback. The story is told mostly non-chronologically, uh, with two primary jumping off points, a dental chair and a Christmas party, for a series of flashbacks, some fragmentary, some extended scenes. So the first scene we see actually takes place in the chronological middle of the story, a Christmas Eve day rugby match during which Machen has his front teeth broken by an opposing player, and then afterward uh, convinces Mr. Weaver, who is one of the team's uh, two owners, to take him to a dentist, who, before going to work on the broken teeth, gives Machen gas as an anesthetic. So that's the first uh, jumping-off point. From this image of a bloody-mouthed uh, Machen unconscious in the dentist chair, we get our first series of flashbacks that essentially show us the rise of Frank Machen how he was able to emerge from the coal mine and make the team. Now, the second jumping off point uh, comes after the dental work, as Machen, uh, still reeling from the gas, attends a Christmas party at Mr. Weaver's mansion, where he drinks beer to dull the pain, and finally uh, falls asleep in an upstairs room, where a second set of flashbacks brings us to the opening match and the broken teeth. And then the final third of the film uh, moves in straightforward linear fashion right up to the incredible final shot, the only time that slow motion is used in the film. Now, despite the fact that this flashback structure derives directly from the novel, it was the director, Lindsay Anderson, who received the credit and in one case the blame for it. Most critics felt, as I do, that this structure is one of the film's strongest elements. But Pauline Keel, who had a kind of uh, proletarian suspicion, of avant-garde techniques, as she hated Antonioni, for example, uh, she found or claimed to find the structure baffling, which I find her bafflement baffling. But this flashback structure, in the eyes of the critics, connected Anderson with some of his uh, avant-garde contemporaries. For example, a French New Wave director, Alain René, who had made a much more disorienting use of flashback in Hiroshima Mon Amour and uh, last year at Marienbad. But another connection between Anderson and the French New Wave is that, uh, like many of those directors, including Francois Truffaut, Jean-Luc Godard, and uh, Claude Chabrol, Anderson had started as a film critic right after the war, first on a magazine called Sequence, which he edited from 1947 until it folded in 52, and then uh, Sight and Sound. Although by that point, 52-53, he was already making his own documentaries. But it was around this time that Anderson and two other men who would become prominent uh, British New Wave directors, Carol Rice and Tony Richardson, established what they called the Free Cinema Movement, which had its own manifesto written by Anderson, which they published, that laid out the movement's uh, primary goals, which were number one, to break free of what they saw as British cinema's overemphasis on upper-class London settings that either excluded or lampooned the working class, and number two, a more distinctive personal brand of filmmaking that de-emphasized uh, the famous uh, British team spirit and focused more on the individual. So these three men, uh, two Oxford-educated Brits, Anderson and Richardson, and a Jewish refugee from Czechoslovakia, Carol Rice, who as a 12-year-old in 1938 had been rescued from Nazi-controlled Europe by a mostly British effort called Kinder Transport, which certainly saved his life. His parents were both murdered at Auschwitz. But starting around 53, these three uh, free cinema advocates launched uh, two major activities. First, they presented a series at London's uh, National Film Theatre that showed independent films from Britain and abroad, including first showings outside their native countries of work by a number of directors who would soon become famous, including uh, Truffaut and Roman Polanski. And second was the production of low-budget documentaries on a variety of either uh, working-class or everyday subjects, 
one of which, uh, directed by Anderson and narrated by Richard Burton, uh, called Thursday's Children, about a school for the deaf, won the Oscar in 1955 for Best uh, Documentary Short. But by the end of the 50s, all three were involved in theater directing, and it was at this point that uh, three overlapping British artistic movements or tendencies merged to become the British New Wave. Free cinema, the Angry Young Man movement, and what was called uh, kitchen sink realism. The Angry Young Man movement, led by a group of playwrights and novelists whose work dealt with working class themes and uh, generally featured, well, angry young men as protagonists. The two leaders of that movement were John Osborne and uh, Alan Silito. Osborne's play, Look Back in Anger, touched off the movement in 1956, and Silito's novel, Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, and his short story, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, were seminal works as well, and all three were later made into successful uh, British New Wave films. Now, kitchen sink realism, which, like the Angry Young Man movement, kind of overlapped uh, with the free cinema movement uh, in its goals, was really nothing new. It was just a specifically British version of social realism, which in literature dates back to the 19th century, and in theater and film showed up here in the 1930s with the group theater in New York producing a number of naturalistic working-class dramas, and then many Hollywood films in the mid to late 30s, a dead end, for example, dealing with the working class uh, from a left-wing perspective. And then, after the war, social realism achieved its greatest cinematic expression in Italy, where, for reasons I've never really understood, it was called neorealism. But in post-war Italy, masters like Roberto Rossellini and uh, Vittorio De Sica produced their own brand of social realist films, often using non-professional actors with incredible results, uh, something for which the Italians uh, seem to have a particular genius. But the convergence of these three movements produced uh, the British New Wave, not, in my opinion, the most uh, creative or entertaining of the many uh, new waves of that era, French, Japanese. There's a sameness uh, to many of these British uh, products. But the film adaptation of Look Back in Anger kicked off the British New Wave in 1959, and this sporting life was really the end. By 63, British audiences, after riding this uh, rather bleak, exclusively black and white wave for five years, found welcome relief in the exciting uh, color world of the James Bond films, as well as the Beatles and all that. So the British New Wave at that point was done. But its major directors, to their credit, adapted and really thrived. Tony Richardson uh, with Tom Jones, his irreverent adaptation of the 18th century novel, which won Best Picture in 1964, Anderson delving more into uh, surrealism and satire in his later films, the most uh, successful of which, If, starring Malcolm McDowell about a violent uh, insurrection at a boys' boarding school, won top prize at the Cannes Film Festival in 1968, a year of insurrection. And uh, Carol Rice uh, went on to direct a number of uh, different genre pictures in Hollywood. Probably the most successful was The French Lieutenant's Woman, with Meryl Streep and Jeremy Irons, released in 1981. Now, some have questioned why Machen would be interested in Mrs. Hammond at all. As I said, uh, she often puts him down, and uh, though she does submit to sex, she does so grudgingly, doling it out in small portions here and there, and always on her own terms. Uh, for example, never in her room, always in his which underlines the fact that she never truly uh, lets him in. So why would Frank be so fixated on this uh, somewhat older, pretty ordinary-looking landlady when his status as a local hero, not to mention his disposable income, would certainly make him attractive to any number of women? And I think one possible explanation for this, on top of the kind of uh, Lazarus-come-forth rescue fantasy that I mentioned, is that Machen's aggressive personality would likely be aroused, not repelled, by her resistance, which rarely wavers. After all, pushing through resistance is his bread and butter, right? And there's another a really good scene in the film that I think may support that theory, where Mrs. Weaver, the wife of one of the team's owners, 
invites Machen over when Mr. Weaver isn't there and uh, openly offers herself to him, which it's implied is something she often does with her husband's players. But the very openness of that invitation, in sharp contrast to Mrs. Hammond's resistance, makes Machen uneasy, and after a kiss, he backs off and leaves. I think for two, well, for three reasons. First of all, he's out of his depth uh, socially, and he knows it. Second, uh, he's smart enough uh, to foresee potential negative professional uh, consequences. The memory of that coal mine kind of hangs over him like an invisible shroud. He does not want to go back there. But third, I think Mrs. Weaver's easy acquiescence reduces his sense of himself, his ego. He likes to win, uh, certainly, but he likes to push through and win. And for him, and I think for many, perhaps most people, the pushing through is more exciting than the winning. Now, one element in the film that I find a less than convincing is the implication that uh, Machen is somehow being exploited by the team's owners. Mr. Weaver, in particular, is presented from the outset as not just uh, coldly manipulative, which would certainly be plausible, but downright sinister in a gangsterish uh, kind of way. So you keep waiting for his behavior to justify this presentation, but it never happens. In the end, he's just a businessman. And I couldn't help seeing this as a vestige of the left-wing uh, social realist sports films produced in Hollywood in the 30s and 40s, usually centering on boxing, which certainly was uh, controlled by gangsters at that time. But films like Golden Boy or Body and Soul, where the boxers are initially bankrolled by gangsters, but eventually pressured to take a dive. Which, if they do, uh, their integrity is compromised, and if they don't, uh, they're dead. But in the 30s, uh, stories like that were often intended as a metaphor for what left-wingers, socialists, communists, and there were a number of them in Hollywood in the 30s, what they saw as the fundamentally exploitative relationship between owner and worker. Now, like boxing, uh, rugby is certainly brutal. There's no question about that. But Machen is very well compensated, with no strings attached, earning enough to buy not just a fur coat for Mrs. Hammond and a TV for her kids, but a jaguar for himself as well. So how is that exploitation? And beyond the money, as I said, uh, he's hero-worshipped by the locals, which the owners are certainly not, so it seems to me he's getting plenty out of the deal. I mean, bottom line, it got him out of the coal mine, right? So that element uh, feels a little glib and misleading to me. As do a handful of scenes and brief moments that imply or seem to imply homosexuality. Uh, there's a character called Dad Johnson, played well by William Hartnell. As David Story later explained, every rugby team and every soccer team had these kind of uh, self-appointed camp followers who would scout players, usually for no compensation, in order to kind of parasitically bask in the glow of the athletes. So we learn early on that this Johnson had facilitated Machen's initial tryout for the team and may or may not have expected something in return. Without ever being made explicit, it's implied uh, more than once that Johnson has some sort of homosexual interest in Machen. At one point, uh, Mrs. Hammond tells Machen, he ogles you, looks at you like you're a girl. Now, that could be just another one of her cracks, but he does seem uncommonly fixated on Frank. But then uh, the whole question is just dropped in the final third of the film, as the Johnson character literally disappears from the story, so we're left wondering. And there are a couple other brief moments. After Mr. Weaver signs Frank to the team, for example, he gives him a lift home in his Bentley. And when they get in the car, Weaver looks at Machen and says, Property of the City. That's the name of the team, a city football club. And then he grabs Machen's thigh, which Anderson highlights with a close-up. So along with the fact that Weaver apparently tolerates his wife sleeping with his players, it does kind of raise questions about his sexual preferences, but this too is dropped. And then finally, there are some uh, gratuitous shots after a rugby match where completely naked players, uh, who you only see from behind, but even that was very unusual for a British film in 1963, but the players are naked in this kind of large community bath, 
are kind of splashing around in mock wrestling in a way that seemed uh, to me uh, very unlikely uh, for heterosexual men. And in his next film, If, which I mentioned, that is loaded with young male nudity and even stronger implications of homosexuality. But there too, Anderson presents it, but then leaves it uh, unexplained, unexplored, and unresolved. I mean, in this film, it's a minor blemish. As I said, uh, these moments are fairly fleeting. But if you're going to introduce that element, okay, deal with it, you know? Make your point if you have one. Don't just sneak it in, then back off. That seems to me kind of childish and uh, cowardly. I mean, to me, it shouldn't be there at all. It adds nothing but confusion. And frankly, at 2 hours 15 minutes, the film was a little too long anyway. Uh, especially given the fact that it's not a straightforward narrative, but presented non-sequentially. But the major strengths of this film, which certainly outweigh these minor flaws, are first of all the acting. From the leads to the supporting roles, Hartnell as the scout I mentioned, Mr. and Mrs. Weaver, the teammates, even the dentist, all fantastic. With that wonderful trait of the British, and I should say the Irish and the Welsh as well, in the case of the two leads here, to not overact. The second major virtue, as I said, is the flow of that flashback structure. Anderson has a definite knack for knowing just when to take us back in time and then forward again, which he does with hard cuts, not dissolves, which I think was a wise choice. And then finally, uh, something I haven't talked about at all, The atonal musical score by Roberto Gerhard, uh, which I found very striking and very effective. The music is certainly reminiscent of the work of the original atonal composers, Arnold Schoenberg, Anton Webern, what they were doing in Germany before World War I. But uh, Gerhard uses much more percussion than those guys ever did, and he does so with great skill. But there's a wonderful tension of opposites between, on the one hand, these rugby matches in the industrial north of England before big stadium crowds of working class people, and on the other, this kind of sparse, fitful, avant-garde score. It's a truly brilliant and courageous touch. Uh, The only music Gerhard wrote that Anderson did not like was for the opening credits. So Anderson, acting on his own, took samplings from the rest of the score and stitched them together for the opening credits which, and I say this as a former composer, I think was his perfect right to do. It's his film, after all, and it totally works. Uh, But Gerhard was furious at what he saw as a betrayal and refused uh, not only to see the film, but to speak to Anderson for several years afterward, although they did eventually uh, make up. So not an easy film, nor an entirely pleasant one, but gripping, innovative, and completely uncompromising. It did not do especially well at the box office in 1963. Again, audiences, especially in Britain, had grown somewhat tired of this kind of thing. But a huge critical success, both in Europe and the US, with the exception of Pauline Kiel, and very influential. I would say more on some of the great filmmakers of the 70s than the 60s, with its visceral nature and focus on the individual. Now, what's interesting is this film really stands alone in Lindsay Anderson's output for those traits I just mentioned, that kind of visceral hyperrealism. This was really his first and last film like that. His later films, while also uncompromising, as I said, a traffic more in surrealism and satire. Actually, in the 1980s, Anderson was interviewed about this sporting life. I think it was the 25th anniversary of its release. And he said, uh, that wasn't my film. It's David Story's film, which I'm sure is overstated. Uh, Anderson definitely contributed. But I think there's probably more than a little truth to Anderson's remark, uh, which is why I spent a little more time today on the screenwriter's background than I normally would. But honestly, I've never seen a film quite like this. And I've seen my share of films. uh, So I think Anderson and his collaborators definitely succeeded in achieving uh, one of the goals uh, set out in that Free Cinema Manifesto, a very distinctive, highly personal film. So check it out, my ninth-ranked film of 1963, This Sporting Life. Back in a moment. 
Your feedback is important to us on Twitter at Realtime 1960s, on our Facebook page, or you can email the program Realtime 1960s at gmail.com. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you. And if you'd like to join our family and help us continue to bring you great content, please go to patreon.com slash realtime 1960s and subscribe. Don't forget to visit us at realtime1960s.com for our timeline, each and every podcast, links to social media, how to reach us directly, everything you need to know about this portal into the past that we are creating. Thanks so much for joining us and stay tuned for the next installment of this ongoing series covering the top 10 films of 1963. So take care and I'll see you soon. Music